So, I don't have my recording because my iPad's being stupid, so we're going to use this iPad, and so I can't finish that last example from section 7.4, but it's okay because it was really short. So this section, which is section 7.5, it's called Strategy for Integration, is really a review of all the previous sections. So when we ask you questions on your test, we, we're going to say integrate these things. We're not going to tell you what technique you have to use. Does that make sense? It's your job to choose what technique. So this, and sometimes, as one of the homework questions on the take-home quiz involves three different things. So I think one of the take-home quiz questions we're actually going to kind of do in class today. So you'll see it there. Yeah. Yay, something kind of similar to it. So if multiple methods work, then we can just use whichever one we like? Um, no, well, yes, if multiple methods work, you can use whichever one you like. Um, but sometimes we may have, have to apply different methods to different parts of a problem. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like sometimes you did integration by parts and then you got substitution, right? So these are the techniques that you sort of know thus far. The substitution method, when did you learn that one? Allegedly. Calc, Calc 1. Um, integration by parts, that was our first thing. When do you, what's a hint that you might use that? It's a product, yeah. It kind of works for products quite well. Trigonometric substitution, that's when you... Well, when you see trig functions. When you see trig functions and you let... You use the Pythagorean identities or what other identities we have we can use? Half angles, okay. Trigonometric integrals, that was section 7.3. That's when you like let x equal a sine theta or something to that effect, right? Um, partial fractions, that was the previous section that we just did. And then the last thing is some combination of these methods, as in not just one. Okay. So you should always kind of triage and ask yourself the easiest method of substitution, right? Yeah. Ask yourself, can you do that? Yes. In this one, can you let u equal something and will it fall out? Yeah. Yes. What could you let u equal? Just sine x? I would let u equal 1 minus sine x. I think it will technically work with just sine x. It's just that your answer might look, well, your answer will look the same in the end. So if your u is 1 minus sine x, what your, what's your du? Negative cosine x dx. Negative cosine x dx, great. And you just have cosine x dx, so negative du is cosine x dx. I had the pleasure of grading the question on the take-home quiz that involved this kinds of thing, and a lot of people were so sad, like they knew their du was negative, but then they forgot to put it in their like work or their answer. So just watch out for stuff like that. Like go back and check your answers over, make sure that you actually put your negatives in there and distributed them or something. Or you could just say negative du in the top and then you won't miss it, right? Over u. Yes, it should. It should be negative natural log absolute value of u plus c or negative natural log absolute value 1 minus sine x plus c. Let's think. Um, you could, you don't have to do that, but you could have written it as ln absolute value 1 over 1 minus sine x, because that is like a negative exponent. Yep. But you don't have to do that. Like, it's not required. It's just if it happens when you're, like, checking your answers. Okay. Okay. How about this one? It's technically a product, and maybe you could use integration by parts, but then you have to, like, differentiate e to the root t, which is not very much fun, is it? No. So... A kicker with Calc 1, when you first learned substitution, was just to try to let u be the thing inside of something else and hope that the derivative came out somehow, right? So what's the thing you would let u equal? Uh, root, t. root t. Yeah, that would be my... It can also be rephrased as t to the one-half. One okay, so... du is then... One over two uh, root t. One half t to the negative one half dt. 
And yep, if you're a bit faster, that's one over two root t dt. And your original integral, it had dt over root t, right? So how could you make it so that it's perfect, a perfect substitution? Multiply by two, yep. So two du equals one over root t dt. Okay, now, so I'm gonna change this. This just becomes, I think, integral of e to the two e to the u du. You do, I was gonna actually go there in just a sec. I know some of you like are really bothered by this change the bound things and you don't like it, but it's so much easier. It's so, much easier. so just gonna give it a try. And I can, it's also more accurate. On the take home quiz, uh, so Caleb told me that when he graded that question, I think 40% of people who did not change their bounds got it right versus 70% of people who did change their bounds got it right. Okay. Still not good huh? Those are still not good numbers. <laughs> 70 is a lot better than 40. Well, yeah. But it'd be 70 better. isn't great either. Yes, you're totally right. But <laughs> just saying. Okay, so if t is equal to 1, u is equal to root 1 or 1. If t is equal to 4, then u is equal to 2. two. We have to technically like, do the positive you, negative. No, because there's no plus minus in front of the square root sign. Okay. So 2 e to the u evaluated from 1 to 2 because the antiderivative of 2 e to the u is 2 e to the u. Yes? Since you're only evaluating at the end, can you like go through the process? Since I'm only evaluating at the end, what do you mean? Uh, can you go through the process of integrating without having uh, limits, I mean. No, you cannot. Because that's one of those things in which you claim something is equal to something that is not equal to. So when you um, integrate this function that have bounds, what comes out is a number, right? Yeah. If you leave the bounds off, that's a function. As in a thing that would have x's or t's in it in the end. So I think, are you, you're, are you saying you don't want to change the bounds and you no, want no, to, like okay. You only add the bound to the end, like you integrate it as a... Uh, if you do it nicely, you can do the work on the side and you can do that, but I don't think it's actually easier. Okay, like I think that yes, you, if, you, if you do it correctly in a nice and neat and organized way, yes you can, but I don't think it's actually gonna be helpful. Ask me after class and I'll show you how you'd have to do it, okay? But in general, I don't think it's the best way, so I don't really want to do stuff that way. It's not the fastest. And you can, as long as you kind of work the integral out on the sides without bounds and find out what it's equal to, and then you plug your bounds back in on a separate step. You can do it that way, but I don't think it's actually faster or any better. Yeah? The convenient thing about changing the bounds is you don't have to go back to t to solve the integral substitute. It's really cool, yeah. It's a lot, it really is a lot better. If you want to be convinced that it works, you just need to come talk to me. I don't mind helping you. It's just that that's calc one, this is calc two. So, oh man. Okay, so on your quiz, there was one question that gave you, a, like, you all tons of trouble. If you got something wrong, this is the question. It was that question that was integral sine inverse of two x. And it's integration by parts. And it's one of those things where you have to take dx as being part of your integration by parts, part of your product. The thing to do there was to let u equal sine inverse of 2x and to let dv equal dx. That kind of trick is something that works with integration by parts sometimes. And a big hint that that's going to happen is it's an inverse function. It works for inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. Natural log also is a kind of inverse function, right? Okay. So... My hint is this problem sort of starts in a similar manner. So what do you think you're going to let u equal? Natural log of 1 plus x squared. Yep, the whole thing. Natural log of 1 plus x squared. And its derivative is? Uh, 2x over 1 plus x squared. Do you guys understand where the 2x came from? Mm -hmm. That came from the chain rule? 
and the only thing left to be your dv is dx, dx and your v is equal to x. I'll give you a big fat hint. Stuff you miss in your quizzes often shows up in your tests. You can make sure that you figure that stuff out. Okay, so the formula here is uv minus integral v du. So that's x ln 1 plus x squared minus integral. And then what do I have for the rest of it? Mm -hmm. 2x squared over. Mm -hmm. Two, it's definitely 2x squared. 1 plus x squared. Okay. Yes? Can you also write 1 plus x squared as 1 plus x all squared? No, you okay. cannot. There's, yep, yep, no, you cannot. Answer your own question. Okay. So now the question is, what do you do with that last piece? And this is kind of related to the stuff we learned in 7.4 about partial fractions. What did you do when the denominator's power was greater than or equal to the, the numerator's power was greater than or equal to the denominator's power? Long division. So who goes inside the checkbox? The 2x, I'm sorry, it's not a better word for that, but the 2x squared goes right into that, right? What's going into it? Uh huh. Probably easier to say x squared plus 1, is but yes. It's not a place where it's easier to pull the 2 out in front of the integral? Oh, that, it'll be fine as well. Okay. I just didn't do it, but yes, it will be totally fine to pull it. It's always legit to pull the 2 out. Okay, so what do you multiply this x squared plus 1 by to make it match 2x squared? 2. x squared plus 2. Take it away. What's your remainder? Negative 2. So you have x ln of 1 plus x squared minus blah, integral of 2 minus 2 over 1 plus x squared. Do you guys agree that negative 2 was the remainder and 2 was the quotient? Okay. And let's do two things at once. Let's both, let's both distribute the negative and anti-differentiate. So the x ln of 1 plus x squared carries down. What's the antiderivative of 2? 2x. Should my next term be positive or negative? Positive. positive. And at 2, mm -hmm. arctan or tan inverse of x. You just have to know that the tangent, the derivative of our inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Yep, that's one of the ones you had to have memorized from Calc 1. So much you can't forget. Huh? You work on memorizing those things. You should. All right, how about this guy? What technique will we be using? Partial fractions. A big hint for that is that you see your ratio, right? Okay, so to do that, you begin by factor. So first of all, the numerator's degree is less than the denominator, so there's no need to do long division, right? You need to factor the denominator. What does that factor into? Mm -hmm. So x squared and x plus 3, right? Is that, is that right? Oh, it's just x and, oh, you're right, I, oh, but I want to do that other one. Okay, well, whatever. Okay, 2x minus 3 and then x times x squared plus 3. Okay, great. They're both equally simple. Uh, okay, if you say so. So, what's the partial fraction decomposition for when you have a irreducible quadratic like that. We'll have an A over X, and what's the rest of it? BX plus C. Mm 
Okay, and then you kind of multiply by the denominator of the left side, and you get 2x minus 3 equals a times x squared plus 3 plus bx plus c times x. Great. Any clever plugging in we can do? Zero. Zero? Sure. So we don't have to do long division now? There's no need to do long division when the degree is bigger in the bottom. Okay. You do long division when the degree is bigger in the top. Because in, in the polynomial world, you do long division when the polynomial on top is kind of greater than the one on the bottom. With polynomials, greater means higher power. Kind of like 9 over 2 you can divide, but 2 over 9 you would get a decimal for that. Right? right? Yeah. That's greater than or equal to. Or equal to, yeah. Okay. So think bigger or equal to on top is when you divide, just like with numbers. But bigger in this world means bigger powers. OK, if you input 0, I think we get a is negative 1. Do you guys agree? You get negative 3. No, I'm pretty sure it's just negative 1. Isn't it? Oh, it's 2x minus 3, not 2x minus 1. Yeah, yeah, 2x minus 3. So a is negative 1. Now to find the rest of those coefficients, you have to do this sort of gathering of like terms we did in one of the later examples yesterday. By yesterday, I mean Friday, because it's always, it's always yesterday in class world with me. So that's whose is going to be ax squared plus 3a plus bx squared plus cx. Is that part all right? Yeah. Okay, then group them. you got these x squareds, a plus b times x squared plus cx plus 3a. That's equal to 2x minus 3. Can we input a? Yeah, we can. I'm, I'm not going to do that quite yet, but you could input a. Does it make sense that a plus b has to equal 0? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Because there's no x squared on the left side, so the coefficient of x squared had to be 0. Since we know a is negative 1, therefore b is equal to one. positive 1. Exactly. And c is super easy. What does c have to equal? 2. And we could have also said, oh, negative 3 equals 3a, and therefore a is negative 1. But we already have that information, right? What's that, Mary Kate? How did I get the b? I know a is negative 1. Just substitute it in. Yep. OK. How did you get a gets negative 1? I mean, in the beginning? Yeah. Um, I plugged in 0 for x. <coughs> OK. And so I plug in 0 for x in the left side. 2 times 0 is 0. I get negative 3. Right? On the right side, plugging in 0 for x kills off this term completely. Yeah. And this is 0 squared plus 3, which is 3. And divide by 3. Yep, OK. If you don't like it that way, you could have also gotten it right here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so that you also would get negative 1. And since you know you have to do this step anyway, maybe it makes sense just to do it all this way. OK? okay? Yeah. All righty. No problem. OK, so this becomes shh, 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 shh. negative 1 over x plus uh-huh, so bx plus c, b is 1, so x plus 2 over x squared plus 3. And I believe, although I could be, I think I'm, I think I'm right, we did something a little bit like this in section 7-4, didn't we? Uh, did that create long division? Nope, nope. Is the, is, the, is the power bigger in the numerator of that second fraction? No. Or equal to? No, it's not. So how do you do this second one, the second thing? You can you break it down. What do you break it into specifically? Mm -hmm. Exactly, plus 2 over x squared plus 3. Can we forget our dx's along the way? How many points are these? That's a great question, and I plead the fifth for now. OK. OK? So which is the right to remain silent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you later, OK, because I have to discuss stuff like that. 
it is really important in count three. So just FYI, it's a good be prepared. So negative ln absolute value of x. Can you guys do the middle one without actually doing the substitution? Yes, I half the half ln. Uh huh. And do you technically need the absolute value bars there? No. no. Okay. And ooh, this next one. So it's arctan, right? Yes. And it's x over root three. Very good. And what's the coefficient in front going to be? Two over, Two over three. Yep. Plus c. Okay. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, on the quizzes, am I allowed to just do all my work on uh, uh, on scratch paper that I staple to the back of the quiz and just write the answers down on the quiz? I need to also see your work is like modestly organized, okay? So let's chat later about it, okay? Because it's kind of specific to you question. Just I'm running out of room already. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just later, okay? Yeah. Is there a penalty for superfluous absolute value bars? No. Okay. Okay. How about this one? Possibly. What technique are you using? Because you're right. Parts. Integration by parts, which I'm just going to call IBP, because that's like nice abbreviation, right? So u is equal to x. And the kicker is that dv, which is secant x tan x, dv needs to be something that you can actually anti-differentiate, as in go backwards. Perfect. How do you can, right? What's the antiderivative of secant tan? Secant. And what's the derivative of x? Yay. And what's the So uv minus integral v du. Was that x? Secant x minus the integral of secant x? I was serious about not making you memorize that one, but I think by now you probably have, haven't you? Yeah, against your will, do you feel like oppressed? Okay, no, okay, x, secant x. What's the antiderivative of secant x? Mm -hmm. Yep. There you go. Clarify. Yeah. The derivative is the one thing, but then when you go backwards, it's completely different. Yeah, that usually is the case, right? I mean, it's just like if your u was x squared, its derivative is 2x dx, its antiderivative is 1 third x cubed, which actually is something totally different. That's it just happens to also be a polynomial. Yes? Yeah, go ahead. Keep asking. I, I, I was actually saying, like, Okay, I think I was like confusing my tangents by secants, but I thought you were like taking the derivative of something and then integrating that derivative back into. No, the no, we definitely, we definitely were not doing that, right? We, we took the antiderivative and then we integrated that antiderivative again. We did two integrations in a row. Yeah. So the derivative of se derivative, excuse me, of secant is or the antiderivative of secant is ln. The derivative of secant is secant tan. The antiderivative of secant is ln of all this junk. The antiderivative of cosecant is... Ooh, the antiderivative of cosecant. Take a guess. It's, uh, negative, negative, natural natural negative natural log. Negative natural log. Do you see how it's kind of similar-ish? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nope. Great question. And that definitely won't come up on a test unless I give you the formula. Okay. okay? Like, it might be on WebAssign because uh, that happens sometimes, but it won't be on a test. Yeah. You do not have to re-derive the formula. Okay. That's what you're asking, right? Yeah. No, you do not have to do that. Yes? So on WebAssign, like, is it possible to, like, if you can't quite figure out the specific problem they ask, because the way they worded it, can you ask for a slightly different word one? Well, I think you can ask to see a similar example, and from which it should be able to, they won't change the wording, they just change the numbers. So the best thing to do then is to ask me for help, which means you must work on your homework early and not late as in the day I teach it, not the day it's due. Okay, moving on. How about this guy? So with sines and cosines, your two options are half angles and Pythagoreans, right? When do you have to use the half angles? When they're both the powers are even. If there's somebody 
who's odd, then you can use the Pythagoreans, which is definitely easier. So who, is, who are you going to save here, a sine or a cosine? Save a cosine. So that's being saved. This thing needs to change to the other trig function. So, so that's cosine squared. Squared. Mm -hmm. And what is cosine squared in terms of sines, as in? One minus sine squared. Do you want to put the U of substitution in now, or do you want to solve that as uh, one minus sine squared T? Uh, it actually doesn't now. matter, but I think that if you put the U of substitution now, you use a lot less characters, mm -hmm. less writing. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now you U sub, and what's your U going to be? You have to do math on Twitter. Yes. You guys should all do math on Twitter. Actually, you should do your homework first. You know, stay off Twitter. Twitter's waste of time. It's like Facebook is. <laughs> Speaking from experience. So. They're all waste of time. Okay. So, u to the fourth. 1 minus u squared squared. D u. Do you guys agree with that substitution? Yeah? Okay. What do you get when you expand before you distribute the u to the fourth? One minus two u squared plus u to the fourth. Great. One minus two u squared plus u to the fourth. Then you distribute and you get u to the fourth minus two u to the sixth plus u to the eighth. Anti-differentiate and you get one fifth. Can I put the function back in right away? Okay, one fifth sine to the fifth t minus two sevenths sine to the uh huh, and then plus a ninth plus c. As in with that, with as in yeah, not you, doing yeah. the substitution. Yeah, if you did not done the substitution, like going all the way down, then did the substitution. Yeah, I think it would take more time. All right, what technique do you think this is? Exactly, and a big hint is that you see a square root. But remember, that isn't actually always true. So sometimes you can use without square roots, like when we proved the formula for arctan, right? Okay, so what are you going to let x equal? Think just sine theta, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Now, if you're going to forget anything with this technique, don't forget to replace dx. If you do that, you're going to be messed up. Okay, so what's dx in this case? Cosine theta d theta. And a, so you should change your bounds, yep. If x equals 0, that's saying 0 is equal to sine theta. And the restrictions that we had from before tell us, like, to pick the angle between negative pi halves and pi halves. So the theta that does this is zero, okay? It's easier to change your bounds. But the thing is, this is an x, right? So it goes in for the x. Does that make sense? You figure out which theta makes that happen. What if x is root two over two? Then we have root two over two equals sine theta. So what angle makes that happen? Pi over four, very good. I mean, we're going to carry you, that error all the way through. Uh, you'll lose one point for that error, probably, depending on how we decide to penalize that particular error, but you won't lose multiple points. Does that make sense? We penalized once in a consistent way for that mistake. Okay. Although I must say, the easiest thing I can do to you is give you root twos over twos, right? Right. As in, like, the, the hard ones are the sixth and the sixth and the thirds because they flip-flop, but the easiest ones are the, the ones on the axes, 
The second easiest are the quarters, because you know the quarters. Okay, but if you have a brain fart because it's a test and you're freaking out, yes, only one, penalty, only one penalty. Zero to pi quarters. Okay, so what's the numerator is? Uh-huh. The denominator is root one minus sine squared theta, right? And the dx is, mm-hmm. It's actually quite helpful, you see? You agree that one minus sine squared is cosine squared? So, and when you square root cosine squared, you get, and what happens to the other cosine? Bye. See, if you leave that off, you're gonna totally like make this problem harder than it should be. Do you see what I mean? Like, if you would have forgotten this DX, you see how this wouldn't cancel anymore, and all of a sudden it becomes like much more, like, maybe not even solvable. I don't know how to do it. Do you see what I'm saying? So yeah, so if the integral zero to pi quarters, sine squared theta d theta. Can you do that integral? If you see sine squared, what identity do you have to use? A half angle. So there's going to be a, a half, zero to pi quarters. Is it one plus or one minus? One minus, and it becomes, yep. Are we going to go back to x's in this case? No. Yay! One half times theta minus a half sine two theta. And you can just plug in zero and pi quarters. When we had to go back to x's, we had to use a trig identity in this stage. Remember that? But you don't have to do that anymore in this one if you don't have to go back to x's at all because you have a definite integral and you changed your bounds. So that's one half times pi quarters minus a half sine of, what's that gonna be? Two pi quarters is pi over two. I think when you plug in zero, you get out zero, do you agree? Yeah, that's not always true, but in this case it is true. So I think, what sine of pi halves? It's definitely one, yep. So I think we have pi eighths minus a quarter. I can't remember if the sine is the one or cosine. Cosine is the x and sine is the y. Okay. So that's, and they're alphabetical, which is actually quite helpful. Yeah. Uh, so you, if you did have to bring the theta back to x's, um, the first theta is pretty easy, but to do the sine 2 theta, would you just like arc sine x? Nope. To do theta? the sine of 2 theta, you have to use this 2 sine theta cosine theta identity. So that's how you do it. If you were to have to go back to x's, that is what you would use. Good question. Um, it's because I have this one half up in front, I just distributed it. No problem. Yep. Yep, anything else? About well, that problem, that is. Sometimes problems might be really easy because your teacher didn't make them harder for you. Do you wanna let u equal tangent or u equal secant? I think, I think you can actually let u be secant. Okay, that will work, but I think letting u be tangent is easier, okay? I, I didn't intend to do this, but when we wrote the quiz, the very last question, you can actually have done it either way. And so I, was, I got through like half the quizzes and like, oh shoot, this person did it differently and I see no mistakes in their like work. So I had to work it out and like have two answers for my answer key. So some of you, if your answers might be different than the ones we're gonna post online because you did it the other way. But I think it's easier to let u equal tangent. Because yeah. if you let u equal tangent, du is just secant squared. And that's, I mean, it's just going to become the integral of u to the third du must change your bounds, but, like, that's not so bad, right? 
No. So if theta is equal to zero, u is tan of zero, which is zero. Say that again. I just couldn't hear you. Sorry, I'm just. Because first you look at the x value of tangent just to make sure it exists, and then you look at the other value. What I do is I look and see if I do this substitution, does this derivative show up inside the integral? That's all I choose what to do. I say, oh, if I were to let u equal tangent, it's derivative of secant squared. Oh, I was talking about evaluating tangent. At the bounds, yeah, you have to also be able to plug those bounds in. So, like, if it was pi halves, there'd be trouble. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what if theta is pi quarters? What's tangent in that case? One. One. So zero to one. It's a really easy one, yeah. One quarter u to the fourth from zero to one. So your answer is one fourth. Did you mean to do that? Say that again? Did you mean to do that? What? Make it this easy? Probably not, but the thing is when you're for your homework with this section, some of the problems you're gonna be assigned are just straight up u substitutions. And you're supposed to recognize that, okay, that happens, it's okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Say that, sorry, everyone will stop talking. Say that again. Do you have to substitute tangent back into No, because it's a definite integral, you changed your bounds. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you do not have to. And if you do go back to thetas, you've got to change the bounds back to thetas. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you do go back to thetas, you've got to just, you've got to plug in zero and pi quarters, which should be already into the tangent function, which you've kind of already done. You kind of like just pre-do that. It really is easier. And since it's easier, it takes less time, it's also more accurate. Okay. <coughs> Holy moly. Can you move that three down? Can you move that three down? Any ideas? Yes. U equals x to the sixth. X to the sixth? Yeah. And then du equals uh, six x to the fifth, and it'd be one six uh, e to the square root of u du. That will technically work. I think it's not the easiest way. Okay. There's a better, easier substitution you can make. Any ideas? Yeah. Make that x to the fifth into x to the third times x squared. Yeah. Make that x to the fifth into x to the third times x squared x third x squared. What I would do, sorry, let's just say dx, not du, because this is just how I think Professor Fodd, we did it differently in our notes, but that's okay. I would just let u equal x cubed. Like, start with that. Does that make sense? And then see if it, the integral simplifies. And also, I'm probably going to do integration by parts, right? And that formula involves u's and v's, so I probably don't want to use, use u right now. So we're just going to go back to Arthur. Sorry, bad jokes. Let w equal x cubed. So then what's dw? 3x squared? dx, right? So one third dw is equal to x squared dx. So this x squared dx is one third integral dw. Say that again? Can we pull the 3 all the way down and back out front so they just cancel out? No, you're thinking about rule. The, no, that's a rule for logs, not a rule for e's. Yeah, nope, you cannot. It'll be w e to the w. Do you guys see that? The desks are not big enough, are they? No, yeah. Okay. Is everyone okay with the substitutions that happened? Yes, no? Is that all right? Okay. Now that you're at this stage, what technique do you use? Integration by parts. Integration by parts. And it can't get, this is kind of like the most basic application of integration by parts you're going to see. So u is equal to w. dv equals u w dw. d 
du is dw, and v is e to the w. Be slightly careful with that one third because that integral expands into two portions, so you have to make sure the one third distributes or you use parentheses. So one third w e to the w minus integral of what? e to the w dw, very good. And then it's not so bad, right? Let's plug back in what your u is. One third x cubed e to the x cubed minus one third e to the x cubed. Let's see. Ah. Um. I, I will say so in the directions. Does that make sense? Okay. So on the quiz, I did say so and did penalize you if you did because I did actually ask you to do so. But if we do that, it will be stated in the directions that you must do so. Otherwise, it's up to you. I think you have a quiz question like this. Take home quiz one. Yeah, OK. So if you see x plus sine x squared, you're for, I would say the first thing that comes around is to expand that stuff, right? Do, like do x plus sine x times x plus sine x, wherever that may lead. So if you expand, what do you get? X plus sine x. Plus 2, I think it's, it's 2x yeah. sine x. You buy that? Yes. Plus yes. sine squared x, yep. There are three different terms there, and for every single term, we're going to apply a different technique. Yay! So what I mean is I can do the integral of x squared. That's easy peasy, right? I can add twice the integral of x sine x dx, and then I can also do the integral of sine squared x dx. Do you guys agree with that? Oh, three problems in one. My favorite. I mean, one, of them is really easy to solve. one of them is really easy. Which one? First, first. first one. Okay, you do now have two points because you've expanded correctly and you've done the easy one. Great. What technique must be applied to my middle part? Integration by parts. Okay, I'm just going to kind of like in the corner here pick my U's and V's. So u is equal to x, right? dv equals dx. Oh, so I, uh, yes, use right. You answered the question. I didn't answer my question. dv equals sine x dx. So then du is dx and v is negative cosine x. to parenthesis uv, so negative x, cosine x. If I say plus integral of sine x, do you agree that why that's plus? Yeah. Um, yeah, you should agree why it's plus, but it should be cosine. I was just testing you again. Obviously, that's a lie. I made a mistake. But, you know, I, I, I thought I might deceive you. It would have been minus the integral. As you, did you just say minus negative cosine? Yeah, it also works. It's just I think that if you don't make the double negative into a positive, you're liable to forget it. Does that make sense? I was just copying down what I had, then I later realized it gets simplified. It's okay. Yeah, as long as you simplify it eventually, it's okay. I won't dock you if your work is correct, but just written differently. That's not a problem. What, is, what do you expand sine squared into? Great, awesome. And by this stage, you're pretty much almost done, right? 
you still got to integrate the cosine, right? So if they integrate the pieces in the second thing, right? But it's not so bad. So I can change it all the same color now. So one third x cubed minus two x cosine x um, plus two, two sine x, very good. Plus one half x. Do you guys agree with the one fourth? Yes. And the sine of two x, right? Okay, plus c. Almost. One last thing. Probably should combine like terms, right? Yeah. Just because it's, it's good math. If you do negative two plus a half, I think it's negative three halves, right? Do you agree? Why would that be oh, I was, I, there's no reason. Um, th that's your answer. Good job. I don't know. I, I, just, oh, I got so flustered with my iPad not working and I just can't like think straight. I was testing you again, twice in the same problem. <laughs> Good job. A plus is all around. Okay. The test, I think your test is not until next week, right? Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Yep. Whole class period Maybe 10 minutes. Of course you get a whole class period. It's a sarcasm. Okay. Last one on your notes, and then I'm just going to make up a couple more because I think we've got some time. So it is not obvious what to do with this one, is it? This one's clever, okay? So I think everybody can agree that one thing one could do is take out the root x in the bottom, right? Okay. And I'll give you a slight hint. This is a question you could have done in Calc 1. Could you have set u to the square root of x and that, then, then the x becomes u squared? That's exactly what you do. You let u equal to root x, and then that x is equal to u squared. It's a really clever substitution. Weird. I know, right? It's a weird one. So the thing is, this might happen in your section seven five homework that you get when it's like a little bit strange, but it is a u substitution. And if you get a, if you have a hint like, oh, it's one plus something squared, it's probably going to somehow involve arctan in its answer, right? You can also use things like, well, from alpha to reverse engineer your substitution could have been, right? Like, I don't care if you do that to learn. I care if you do it and then like paste the answer into WebAssign and get it right without knowing why. That's obviously not going to work so well. But using it to reverse engineer what you should have done is a totally legit thing to do. So if u is root x, what's du going to be? 1 over 2 root x. And we have the, so we have that over root x bit, right? So much like a previous substitution we had, 2 du will equal um, dx over root x, right? So we have 2 du over, I think just 1 plus u squared. So the root x, that's part of the du, right? Because your du is dx over root x. What did you do with that one? You said it was the one without x. It was two. I mean, u squared. Okay. And you're asking where the u squared came from? No. Okay. Why didn't you use dx equals two u du instead of? Oh. Yeah, like don't just write from the x equals u squared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Good question dx equals 2u du, this must also work somehow. Because then you have dx equals 2 root x du, and dx over root x equals 2 du. I think the, the reason... Okay, okay, I can do it that way too. Okay, so if you did that, okay, this, it'll work. You replace dx by... 2u du, right? You replace this root x by u, right? And then this becomes 1 plus u squared. And then the u's cancel, and you get back that. Okay, so that would also work. I just didn't think about it that way. Do you guys see what, he did, what we did there? He took this sort of easier thing to work with, found its derivative instead, right? 
Does that make sense? And it reduces to the same thing. Is that so you clear to see that? Okay, so it's not like my way is the only way. Usually it's not the case. All right, what's the antiderivative? Mm -hmm. 2 arctan of u plus c. So it's 2 arctan of That's ln. Okay. Yep. How about I do that one quiz question that gave you lots of trouble? Yeah. What do you think? Sounds good. Sounds good? Sounds yeah, the one that was, it was on the in-class quiz, and it was integral of sine inverse of 2x, <coughs> I believe, right? Yes. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So is sine with a negative 1, does that mean 1 over sine? No. No. Is this equal to 2 over the root of 1 minus 4x squared? Uh, no. No. What did I, what does the little s symbol mean I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to anti-differentiate. What did I just do? I just took the derivative. That's, that will get you one point if you do it right, which means you don't forget the chain rule and you know the formula, okay? So, no, that's the derivative. So, crap. So its technique to do this one is integration by parts. Uh, yep. You let u equal, nope, sine inverse of 2x. And its derivative is that thing that I just wrote down, right? So 2 over root 1 minus 4x squared. Uh, dv is equal to dx, and v is equal to x. So the integral of sine inverse of 2x dx is actually equal to mm -hmm, minus integral, yep, minus v du, yep. And so now what do you do to finish the rest of it? <laughs> Make a substitution for 1 minus 4x squared. dw is negative 8x dx. So take out the 2, I'll say negative an eighth antiderivative of w to the negative one-half. Uh, it's not ln. Um, why, it's a good, it's a common mistake, but why is it not ln? It's, it's only ln if it's one over w to the first. Does that make sense? This is, whenever, mm -hmm, whenever the power is not negative one, then you can apply the reverse power rule. So it'd be w to the one half times coefficient of two. So your final answer is x sine inverse of two x plus a half square root of one minus four x squared plus c. Is that right? Well, it does because when you do integration by parts, you find the derivative. Right? I mean, as in that's part of the process.